Peter Augustine received his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 1981. He was awarded the U.S. Department of Energy Lawrence Award in Natural Defense for contribution to the development of X-ray laser. He won the American Physical Society Award for excellence in plasma physics for the invention of the laboratory X-ray laser. Professor Agassen has been on the faculty at MIT since 1986 and he, was, uh, and he has worked on understanding the physical mechanism associated with excess heat production in the Fleshman Pons experiment since 1989. He was the co-chair of the 10th International Conference on Cold Fusion in 2003 and won the 2004 Preparat Award for the contribution to the Cold Fusion research. Technical staff, please. Um, I, I very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to come here and uh, present on this topic. I, the, the invitation is very much appreciated. Um, at MIT, uh, we gave a course on cold fusion research uh, at MIT in January. And um, that's significant for a number of reasons. The topic is um, very controversial. Um, however, uh, it seems to me at MIT we should be able to deal with controversy and to take controversial areas and uh, think about them and talk about them. Um, science is strong enough to withstand questioning. Um, some of the issues that were talked about at the course um, probably are very relevant for the experiment I'm going to talk about shortly and the data that I'm going to talk about shortly. So sadly, um, I do not have some view graphs that connect with the topics that I'd like to talk about for a minute or two, but I think it's probably important relative to what's coming in this uh, presentation. Um, it seems to me that some of you may not be familiar with research in the field. So as a result, a, a little bit of uh, discussion may be useful. Um, in, in 1989, Fleischmann and Pons claimed to have observed excess heat in the palladium deuteride system. And a number of my colleagues and I got interested in the problem. And at the short course, we presented a summary of results of our research over uh, 23 past 23 years uh, on this topic. Uh, there's been a great many experiments, hundreds of experiments at this point, where the excess heat effect has been seen in many laboratories. So during the short course, we had five days of lectures, two hours each. So it's, it's impossible to review all the material that was presented, but it was an enormous amount of material. Um, some understanding of the experiments has emerged over the years. Um, and along those lines, um, some discussion here is relevant. We'd like to get D2, molecular D2, into the lattice, but in palladium deuteride, the electron density is too high. But you can reduce the electron density if you have a vacancy. Now, interestingly enough, if you load palladium deuteride to a very high loading, such that there's on the order of close to one deuterium per palladium in the lattice, it stabilizes the vacancies. And we think that that's really important. Um, once you've stabilized the vacancies with a high deuterium loading, then if you co-deposit more palladium onto the surface, you make more vacancies. 
and some of us think that that's where the excess heat in the Fleisch and Pons experiment uh, comes from. Uh, helium-4 has been observed in many experiments now, uh, time correlated with the excess heat production. And um, at the moment, the helium-4 seems to be produced in amounts commensurate with the energy. Namely, if you figure out how much energy you divide by the number of helium-4 atoms, you find that that ratio is close to 24 MeV, which is A, it's a nuclear energy, and B, it's close to the mass difference between two deuterons and uh, helium-4. We've worked on a model for um, excess heat production in the Fleisch and Pons experiment. Um, I'm primarily a, a theorist, and um, there's a large number of publications of these models, but the basic idea comes from the observation in the experiments that when the energy is produced, there's no commensurate energetic nuclear products. So that presents a very significant theoretical um, headache uh, for modeling. Um, my approach to the problem was to look at models in which a very large quantum is split up into a very large number of smaller quanta. And um, we now have models that work that way, and these models seem to work in a way that makes some sense out of the Fleisch and Pons uh, experiment and out of the excess heat production. Um, in, in order to better understand it, the basic underlying physical effect in the model seems to be one where you can take vibrational energy and convert it into nuclear excitation or vice versa. Um, our, our models do that. Uh, the talk that we just heard about uh, a fracto, a piezo uh, nuclear kind of effect, um, I, I've actually not heard this talk before and I'm not so familiar with the research, but this is exactly the kind of effect that the models uh, talk about. There's a recent experiment that's been put forth by Alexander Carboot at the Luch Institute where samples are excited vibrationally and x-rays come out collimated from the surface of the cathode that was vibrated. And that seems to be consistent with the models. And I think we've identified, we have a candidate now for what nuclear level the vibrational excitation is going to. And it turns out to be a transition in Mercury 201 which happens to be the lowest energy nuclear excitation of any uh, stable nucleus. Um, we've also applied the models to the problem of nickel hydride, which my friend uh, Bill Collis will talk about shortly. And I in this case, um, the models suggest that the energy, our models, our version of it suggests that the energy comes from HD going to helium-3, but acoustical mode uh, excitation, the energy is going in the acoustical mode, and um, that means the nickel is being vibrated, which means that the nickel gets disintegrated because it participates in the reaction some fraction of the time. So in the palladium deuteride system, there's no transmutation of the palladium. In the nickel hydride, some transmutation has been observed. Anyway, this is getting us much closer to the experiments that I'm, is the main topic of the presentation. So the point of view is to get excess heat in palladium deuteride, you need vacancies, you need to load the deuterium into the vacancies, you, you need a triggering, which is vibrational stimulation, and uh, then the product will be helium-4. So the, um, a colleague of mine, Mitchell Swartz, um, has a company which has studied uh, excess heat in palladium deuteride and nickel hydride systems um, since 1989. Uh, there's been a very large number of experiments. Hundreds of experiments have been done by, uh, by Mitchell. He's, he's done more experiments with his own hands than anybody else in the field since 1989. Um, he, he was trained uh, as an electrical engineer originally at MIT many years ago. Um, so in these experiments, which are different from earlier ones, he's working with nano 
uh, palladium embedded in a zirconium oxide matrix. Um, nano materials have been important in the in the recent history of the cold fusion field since about 2000 or so, uh, since a Japanese physicist, Arata, um, got some successful results with palladium nanopowder. So Mitchell's experiment um, uh, takes advantage of that. Um, many people are working with um, nano palladium and nano nickel these days, loading up the palladium with deuterium, loading nickel with hydrogen and hoping to get excess uh, heat. In, in Mitchell's experiment, um, the, d the design itself is um, in some sense revolutionary within the field. Um, in previous years at SRI, some experiments were done where excess heat was seen where a cathode would be loaded electrochemically. And then once the loading would happen, the excess heat would happen also in the electrochemical experiment. Um, Mike McCubrey at SRI has for years been wanting to separate the loading from the triggering. And uh, last year they reported experiments where they would load palladium deuteride, run it cryogenically holding the deuterium in because it would come out otherwise, triggering it electrically and they'd see excess heat. What Mitchell's done is a nanoparticle version of that where the palladium is put into the zirconium oxide when it's constructed initially. He loads it with deuterium. Now he has a sample that he seals. So the sample can be moved to another part of the laboratory or brought into MIT where it can be run. Um, 